My name's Andy. Uh, I work for a company called 5AI. Um, we're based across several sites in the UK. Um, hang on a minute. I've got a mouse here somewhere. There we go. Um, I'm an infrastructure engineer, so I've been doing sysadmin infrastructure stuff for pretty much 20 years now. Um, I've uh, seen all sorts of things over the years, but um, we're uh, working on um, autonomous vehicles. is definitely a new one on me. So what we do, um, basically we are uh, developing software that will power shared and self-driving vehicles in Europe. Um, so a lot of the um, video cannot be loaded. Excellent. So don't worry about that. It was a lovely video. Um, so a lot of the emphasis um, around self-driving cars is very much centered around the US um, and around Asia. Uh, and we are one of a smaller group of people who are working on the problem in Europe, which is frankly more difficult. Um, we're intending to improve the lives of millions of European citizens in countless ways. Um, we think that self-driving cars can be safer, quicker, greener, cheaper, accessible, productive, all of those things. Um, and we have a massive group of very intelligent people from all sorts of um, different backgrounds that are helping us to do that. So basically, uh, I'm here today, I was going to talk to you a little bit about how we have um, started to embrace DevOps as a culture, um, about how we are basically starting to, um, I guess, integrate more with our engineering teams to kind of help 5AI to iterate faster. Um, so there's another video here, but I imagine this one's not going to load either. No, no it's not going to load. So. When I first started nine months ago, um, we were concentrating a lot on incremental improvements to the car. So I was located with our simulation team in London, um, helping them to build out our simulation environments so that we can test parts of our car stack without having to run the car on the road. Um, uh, each of the teams across the sites, we have seven sites, um, each of the teams across the sites were definitely collaborative, but we were mainly fixing bugs one by one building tools in sort of isolated pockets. Um, communication was pretty good and that sort of stuff, but people were sort of centered around their own problem. Um, um, so the next stage of our journey basically was to, um, don't know why that's not showing. Uh, in order to make our mission achievable, essentially, it's not enough to have a really good sort of awesome autonomous vehicle stack. You have to feed it um, lots and lots of uh, lots and lots of tasty data. So we're extracting data from our cars. Um, we're acquiring and generating training data from other source sources in a way that's much more cost effective than running those cars on the road. Uh, if you think about each one of our actual missions out on the road in, at, from our base in Croydon, we've got a safety driver. We've got um, an engineer in there. It costs money to. Uh, run that car, it costs money to tax the car, it costs money to insure the drivers, uh, costs people a lot of time. We generate a huge amount of data, we've got to get that off the car. Uh, lots of complicated problems there. So um, what we wanted to do was build a bunch of tools essentially um, to help us progress off the road um, so that we can test things and improve things like environment perception, like prediction, like planning, uh, vehicle control, and all of the tools and techniques we need to make sure that that car is safe and is providing things safely and that we can confirm that it is safe at all times. So um, the way to do that in a cost effective manner is to train and improve all of the aspects of the car stack independently from each other without having to wait for a new release to go onto the car, sending that car out, doing a run which may take an hour or so coming back, taking the data off the car. It's a long, long process. Um, so we wanted to use the car, the data that the car provides to supplement that with simulated data. Um, and given that a single data dump from the car can be several terabytes, every single component that we have um, in our environment has different requirements for the data, it should be dead easy. So, 
Uh, if we sort of rewind back to nine months ago, um, as you can imagine from an autonomous vehicle company, we've got a lot of clever people that do lots of very clever things. Um, and their first instinct is to, is to shout for help when they get stuck with infrastructure problems. Um, and to be perfectly honest, we didn't make it that easy for them to do anything otherwise. Um, like a lot of organizations, DevOps was uh, company jargon for infrastructure and IT support, essentially. Um, we were a distinct team with all of those responsibilities. We were split across three sites as well, Cambridge, London, and Bristol. Um, but we were essentially bringing up and supporting um, infrastructure services um, and looking after the shared service that underpinned the rest of the organization. But we logged it all in JIRA. We deployed it all with Terraform. So that's basically Terraform. That's basically DevOps, isn't it? So, you know, that's fine. Um, but what we found when we started down this road um, of simulated data and all of this kind of stuff is that a modest DevOps team isn't going to be able to meet the demands of 170 engineers all clamoring for help and support and training and infrastructure. There are only six or seven of us, so no one likes to be a blocker. Um, so we had a bit of a problem there in that we've got all of these really, really clever guys, six of us turning up the infrastructure for them, we needed to come up with a solution so that we could continue to um, uh, continue to deliver stuff at the pace we were expected to. So, what are we going to do about it? Um, it's not all doom and gloom. Um, we've got a head start with a lot of this. We don't have an ancient legacy um, or heritage, as I've heard it called in retail. Um, we're running a lot. Of, we're running most of our code through some kind of CI pipeline. Uh, we're producing containers and artifacts for quite a lot of it. Um, we've got several Kubernetes clusters with production workloads on. We've got real life experience of running them. Um, we, we as a team are quite comfortable with that. Um, we've got things like Prometheus in place, scraping metrics. Uh, we've got things like Elasticsearch in place, collecting logs. So it's, felt, it's, it's relatively trivial then to, for us to instrument our applications to, to just take advantage of that. We've got uh, repositories full of Terraform modules for us to cookie cutter chunks of infrastructure out, like these clusters, um, you know, like chunks of AWS infrastructure. Um, but we had no idea what anyone wanted to do first. Um, so we need to start a conversation with them, which, as you know, for infrastructure engineers, isn't necessarily our strong point. Um, one of the first things we did was sit down with our product owners and find out what, it, what they wanted to do first. Um, we knew we had to build a hell of a lot of stuff very quickly, um, but there would be a certain grace period between them starting coding on a bunch of applications and us having to actually put any of these applications into production. So we had a little bit of leeway. So we built a roadmap out to try and intersect with their critical paths for each of those development teams. Um, we also did uh, what I think was quite important was a conspicuous rebrand. So we stopped calling ourselves DevOps. We renamed all of our Slack channels and we called ourselves infrastructure because that's essentially what we are. Um, it was important to us, I think, that we broke, we broke the link between the phrase DevOps and the function that we were doing. Um, if we were going to help uh, engender this culture, um, it was important to move away from from that label essentially. So we changed the name, we wrote a little blog post, a little explanation of what the culture and practice was. Um, uh, we, made, we changed some distinct lines of communications, we split out infrastructure from IT support, we made sure that people understood, well, as much as possible, what those two phrases meant, and we had a plan for how to manage them. Unsurprisingly, there was a lot of, but, but why have you done this? Um, but, you know, in fairness, there was also a lot of, oh, that makes a lot of sense, now I understand what DevOps actually means. Um, what we also found, which I think was very surprising and very heartening uh, after 20 years of, um, of in this industry, is how much empathy people had when they realized how much work we had to do to support what they wanted to do and how few of us they were. So that was very nice. Um, so cognizant of the fact um, that passive information, like blog posts, no one ever reads them. A few people did. It was good. We had some thumbs up on it. It was great. Um, but we wanted to make sure that this wasn't going to be missed. So we wanted to put some kind of active engagement with our engineers in. So we set up um, an infrastructure guild. 
So it was kind of a loose collective of people. We asked for a volunteer from each of our component teams. Um, and anyone had offered it out to anyone else who had a particular interest in the sorts of things that we do. Um, and we set up a kind of recurring drop-in workshop for an hour and a half every couple of weeks. Um, so we assigned every member of our team, um, a couple of other teams to be a buddy for. So you've got kind of a, an infrastructure GP. So you could uh, drop in for little problems and that sort of thing. You just have someone nice to chat to who understands all of your, um, all of your STIs and that sort of thing. Um, so we had, we had, in fact, we had one of these guild meetings today. Uh, I think it's the third or fourth one. Um, we're actually starting to get a little bit of momentum with them now. It's really nice to sort of see other teams presenting stuff, the problems they found, some of them discovering state locks in Terraform and getting really frightened, but then solving it. Um, they grow up really fast. It's lovely. Um, one of the other problems we had, uh, one of the biggest problems, I think, is we were a blocker um, for a lot of teams turning up infrastructure things. So we use AWS as a cloud provider. Um, and most of those infrastructure requests were funneled through our team, basically because we've moved at a pace traditionally that has been incompatible with fixing technical debt. But um, we've, we had, we've got a specific goal in mind now, so we've had, the, uh, we've had the bandwidth to deal with it. So basically what the teams wanted was compute, data, and storage, which is unsurprising, really. Um, we, you know, we decided on a compute platform. Uh, what, we, what we needed to do, though, was empower them to be able to deal with things without us. Um, so this, um, this quote here is from a really good article. It's about 10 years old now, but it's still, there's still a lot of it that's very, very uh, salient. But one of the pillars of doing cloud is that if you're not offering some kind of self-service to your engineers, then why are you even bothering? You've just got a data, somewhere, data center somewhere that someone else is hoovering for you. Um, up until this point, like I say, we were sort of geared up so that they're all funneled through infrastructure, essentially. Um, and then we'd have the keys to Amazon and we'd hand out little bags of infrastructure from the Amazon sweet shop um, as people needed things. This wasn't going to be viable going forward with loads of people going in different directions. Um, we, we, and we really didn't want to be doing that for them. We didn't want to be making decisions for them like, you know, you don't want to use this database, you want to use this database because I know how to use this one. Um, so we wanted, we wanted to shift this left. Um, the other major decision we made was that our compute platform would be run on Kubernetes because um, it standardizes everything. We've got that uh, expertise. So the mention of the K word brought confusion, apathy, and terror um, in equal measures. Um, after all, you know, computers are confusing enough anyway. Why have we got to put my code into a little package? Why have I got to cram them into a pod? Why can't I get to anything? What the hell is ingress? And you know, it, it was a it was a big, big, big mountain to climb initially, and there was absolutely no way we were going to have the bandwidth to give 170 engineers one-on-one -on -one training. No way at all. Uh, bringing in third-party trainers would have been maybe useful, but it would have been expensive. They're going to give a generic lesson about Kubernetes and the pods and the services, blah blah blah. But that doesn't give them the really important information, which is how they, how they use our authentication schema, how they actually push stuff out of our repositories into Kubernetes, how they run these things, how they... Yeah, so we needed to work out a way for them to deal with our idiosyncrasies because, you know, Kubernetes is like a standard, isn't it? Everyone's got their own one. So we considered doing, we considered doing workshops, but again, that was going to be very time-consuming. We'd need to write them, we'd need to practice them, we'd need to set them up. People were going to want to start hosting their code much faster than we were going to be able to deal with that. Um, and actually, mostly, when we talk to people, they just like learning at their own pace. Um, they want to they wanna take the problem that they've got and get that working. They don't want to get uh, a load of stuff that's kind of vaguely associated with Kubernetes and run yet another Hello World app. It doesn't mean a lot to them. So the best solution we came up for came up with this was for us to write our own documentation. Um, not to try and rewrite the Kubernetes documentation, not to try and rewrite Terraform's documentation, because that's all really good. Um, but just to try and tie those things back to the way we specifically do things inside our environment. Um, so we constructed a couple of static sites to do with um, Kubernetes, how it's tailored to our cluster, uh, clusters. 
power or authorization schema works, how people would be connecting in and, um, and deploying things into there. Um, we built out, excuse me, we built out a couple of sample repositories where we have just a very basic application with like a commit history of how you take that application, containerize it, instrument it for Prometheus, instrument it for Elasticsearch, um, build, out, um, build out Docker Compose and all that kind of stuff for local development, build out all of the stuff you need for Kubernetes, put all that into Terraform, and then they can just take that package if they want and deploy it as is into their namespace or they can take those parts and retrofit them for their own thing. Um, that went down really well, actually. Um, and we tried to get as many people as possible to do that and go through that process before they started anything else. Um, there's an inherent problem with ingress because it's a bit fiddly um, with certificates and DNS and all of those things. So we're, one of the things we're going to do next is build a custom operator that can handle all of those things within our particular domain, as it were. Um, and then at that point we can shift that left as well, but at the moment it's just a Jira ticket into the team. Um, we also did the same with a subset of AWS resources that people wanted, um, things, like, um, things like databases, uh, so RDS and Athena and, um, and Dynamo and all of that sort of stuff, uh, S3 buckets, all of these things. Um, we, built out, um, we built out yet another uh, yet another repository of information for how people could deploy these things. And we've also started now to build out a bunch of sort of standardized, standardized version Terraform modules that people can just call. I want an S3 bucket. Here's version two of it, Bosch, S3 bucket. Um, we're in the middle of that at the moment, but that seems to be going down quite well. We demoed that today. Um, and we're also starting to encourage people to um, to commit to these repositories that are in our that are in our shared source control. So uh, not just the not just the uh, Terraform repositories, but also uh, also the documentation. If people run through a thing that I've written and it's all very you know it's all very intuitive to me, but they run through it and they're like it didn't work at this point because I didn't know what to do. We're trying to encourage people to commit their own amendments to that documentation so that it works better for them. Um, which we haven't, we've had a bit of uptake on. Um, it's been quite interesting. Um, I got a bit of help with some of my awful Python as well, which was nice. Um, but it's starting to become something that we share, and it's not just sort of, um, it's not just sort of a resource that infrastructure give to everyone else. It's something that we share as a business, um, which I think is a really important takeaway. So without really saying it explicitly, we've started to build a build a culture around um, collaboration, learning, sharing. Uh, it's not just it worked fine in devs, it's ops problem now. Um, and it's not something that we can take credit for as an infrastructure team either on our own. Um, the, a, lot of the, um, a, lot of the, a lot of the thrust of what we've been doing has been very much you build it, you run it, which is, you know, it's part of the problem. We're nearly there at that point, but we, we need to build around the other five pillars so that we can support people to do this. Um, each, each team's got their own experiences, but um, what's been really important for me is that the business has had a series of clear and common goals, and it's made this um, it's made this process much much easier um, than the experiences I've had elsewhere in other businesses, especially in larger businesses and enterprises. Um, we're here to deliver something specific at a specific time, and we're all measured by the same outcome. And those things are really important because it means that you're not diverging. You're not going well. My problem here is security, and you can't do this because security. But this guy's over here going, well, I just need to get my database free. I don't care about your security and that kind of stuff. Um, having that clear set of, um, the, of goals that we have, it makes that job much easier. And my experience in the companies that I've worked for is those two things are, are some of the most key factors in differentiating whether your, whether your company can manage a culture shift into this kind of, um, into this kind of environment or whether they, it just fails. Um, I mean, your mileage may vary, but that's definitely been my experience. Um, and it's not just something for startups either. I've worked at enterprises as well where this has worked. Uh, I've worked at many where ideas like um, sharing things and not siloing things are considered blasphemy. Um, and the scars will heal in time. But I'll let you extrapolate which ones I think did a good job and which ones didn't. But there we go. There's the nice DevOps banner on the top of that. Let's just, just destroy that idea. Um, so... I guess, what's next? Um, it's important to note that we're really, really early on this journey. Um, 
we can't simply get to where we want to be. You can't just do DevOps. You've got to understand that cultural change. You've got to understand that it's about looking at, you know, automation measuring and, and, and sort of doing things agile are very important. But for me, the, 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 the two things that kind of bracket that, that culture of sharing the problems, that culture of... Um, that culture of working through these together as a unit uh, are really important for me. Um, we've done a lot of work on that. Yeah, we work, we do agile and stuff and we work in sprints, it's all good. Um, but I think we're doing a really good job with the sharing and collaboration part of it. Uh, there's a lot of, a lot of work for us to do in the future around automation and measurement, but that's basically because we don't really have a fixed, um, a fixed concept of production at the moment. And as we start to develop the product, the ideas around automating the delivery of that product and measuring how we do deliver that and feeding that back will become more and more important. So we're still on that journey. It's important to understand that. Um, as infrastructure engineers at 5AI, we're really lucky to have um, exposure to a ridiculously diverse set of problems. Um, the problems we have to solve around uh, autonomous vehicles are unbelievably complex. Um, and a lot of the solutions haven't been invented yet, but when they do, it'll be really interesting to help them solve that. Uh, we just need to make sure that we keep talking to each other, we keep sharing things, and we, we're, that we're enabling the teams to do things for themselves rather than doing it for them. Um, yeah, and that's basically, that's basically our, uh, our experiences at 5AI. Um, we're hiring if you go there if you're interested in a new job it's very interesting we've got several sites so we can hopefully fit everyone in